welcome to Deconstructing Damsels. I'm your host, Jessica Hannon, and I can't wait to share this episode with you. So, heads up, this month will be Lydia Dare Month, because Halloween, and you can't go wrong with Paranormal and Regency, right? It's like total catnip for me. And you've got these women who know what they want, and and there's a lot of like steam in between, and... I don't even just mean like the sex, I mean just the characters, they kind of know each other and they get to understand each other and I think it's beautiful and great and wonderful. And I cannot wait to share this month with you. So there will be three episodes. The first episode will be Tall, Dark, and Wolfish. That would be this one. And it will feature author Lucy Hudson. And we've been talking on Twitter a little bit, so we'll get more to that in the interview part and the review, but I wanted to give you a heads up. And then there is It Happened One Bite and And In the Heat of the Bite. I'm really looking forward to this because these books were written about a decade ago. They're not relatively new, but there's a whole story and I can't wait to share it. I also want to give a shout out to my patrons, Marlene, Carrie, and Dee Dee. Or Dee, but I call her Dee Dee because she's my friend. She became my friend after being a patron, just to clarify. But anyway. I want to thank them for their support and for giving us a chance to explore what we can do with this podcast because the the money helps and they deserve a shout out for it, right? This episode's review is from Apple and it comes from at Miss Molly BK. Do you think magically a pussy will appear somewhere? A fair question. The book club you didn't know you needed, especially if you have ever waltzed down the bodice ripple aisle. Thanks. I appreciate that. Sometimes I do think that, you know, some men assume that a pussy is just going to be right there. But not always, because you got to earn. The only other housekeeping I have is mid-month, I may be kind of a little bit wonky on Twitter you know, my main focus, because I have a language test for German, because, you know, I live here now, and I have to have a language test because it's part of integration and getting to stay, and I want to know about my new home, and I want to speak with people in my new home because English is not overly prevalent here. It's not not, but it's this whole, like, weird little bubble. So, if I get a little bit quiet during that, Just don't think I've forgotten the podcast. (laughs) I have stuff lined up. I just have to take a few minutes. So, that's it. Everything else is on with the show. Enjoy listening to Lucy and I discuss Tall, Dark, and Wolfish. (laughs) I love it. And stay tuned to the end. (laughs) Thanks. sex scenes i always feel like then it's like okay 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 we know they like each other we know it's porn without plot can we move on now yeah so i i totally get that yeah i just romance is like to me the romance is how does it help the woman uh-huh. like how does her character growth come from this you know like how yeah i'm like how how is it like helping her like how is she moving beyond her limits, right? And then that to me, that's that's what I focus on. So for me to give a low rating, it has to be pretty bad because I can usually find something good with most things. But like I was I was rereading um. In the early two thousands, I I came back to romance for a while because uh, a live journal friend was like, "Hey, you know, you would like Joe Beverly," and I was like, "Oh, I do like Joe Beverly. You're right. Thank you." <laughs> And then I tried to reread it during quarantine, and I went, oh, man, I should have done that for some of these books <laughs> because the shine wore off, and it killed me because I'd, I'd loved it for so long, and I yeah. was like, no, that's wrong. That's bad. I know. That's so hard when you, like, when something that would meant so much to you, and then you look at it through different eyes. There are some things that I won't go back and reread because of that because I want to keep it, like, as the part of my soul that it is, if that makes sense. Yes. That's why I don't reread very often. I'm remembering why. I remembered why during this whole quarantine. I was like, bad plan, because you found out, like, three books you loved at one point you don't like at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I was just like, woof. Yeah. Because, like, I, I, I loved them, and then I was like, well, I have a thing where I don't like, 
I, I found for me as a reader, I don't like, I don't like it when like they've got like the secret babies, but it's like, you know, the secret babies where the man comes in, he's like, well, I want to raise it and you have to marry me. I, I don't like that kind of oh, control issue. Me neither. <laughs> and she's got several of those books in the company of rogues, which I love. That was my favorite series of them, but maybe not so much now. Yeah, I get that. So I used to be a huge Christine Feehan fan. And when I had my first child, what I could consume either through books, TV, movies, whatever changed a lot. Like I really can't consume anything that's too violent anymore. It's like too hard for me to read. And I read one of her books. I had read a ton of them when I was in grad school and then didn't read any for a while. And then she had a new series come out after my son was born and I picked it up and I was reading it and I'm just thinking, Oh my gosh, I cannot believe I loved this. This is horrifying. This is horrible. And now I don't read her anymore, which if I hadn't picked up that new series, I might've always reflected positively on her books. And then I, after I'm reading them, I'm like, Oh yeah, those were really violent. And there was a lot of horrible stuff that happened in them. So, you know, now I don't read her anymore, sadly, but she doesn't need me. She has a huge following. (laughs) So. But I understand. I, I understand it because I read. I've actually read a couple of her books, and I was like, I was so intrigued by them. And then I was like, these are really violent. They're very violent, and they get it's, progressively worse. It's the same reason. Like I can't read Laura Lee. I used to I love the her. first like um, eight, eight or nine books of hers from the Breed series. Imagine like Sexy Time, Dark Angel. Okay. I can imagine um, that. <laughs> yeah, like it's like it's like sexy time, dark angel, but like was was more like um, animalistic features on for you know for the for them to have, but not okay. not as much as like the um, what do they call them? Like the new breed books that I haven't read, but learning the tropes has talked about them a couple times. Okay, but it's, it's not quite you know as animalistic as that. But it's like this weird little gene splicing idea, and so I was interested in it because it had a lot of really interesting political stuff in it, and then I was mm-hmm. like. These are getting more progressively violent, and yeah. I, 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 no. Yeah. As a woman, I have enough violence around me all day. Agreed. No. I want a happy, safe place. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't need to be reading about raping. That's a huge no for me now. Which, when I was younger, didn't bother me as much. I think, just when you, I don't know. I feel like when you get older, you realize more of the uh, reality of it. Yeah. So, you know, one of my favorite books is The uh, Daughter of the Forest by Juliet Marlier. And it includes a pretty violent rape scene in it. And I love that book so much. And I love all her books. But I read it when I was 19. And I don't think I'll ever reread it, even though it's a beautifully written book. And it has a happy ending. It's it's romantic fantasy, not fantasy romance. So there is a romantic plot line, but it's definitely more of a, she's more of a fantasy writer than a romance writer. I I can get that. I liked Anne Bishop when I was a kid, so I get it. Yeah. Or not kid, but when I was a teen. So same same thing, like, you know, that darkness. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it just becomes really hard to, to push for it, mm-hmm. you know, because you're like, oh. but I know people have had this have happened to, and I can't do that. Yeah. I just, I can't. Uh, That was one of the things I really liked about Tall, Dark, and Wolfish, is it was a pretty light-on-the-violence werewolf romance. (laughs) Yeah! Like, that's... Because, like, I haven't read these books in probably a decade when I first read them. So I I, I got them out of the library, and I was, like, over in the romance section, and it said, Werewolves and Regency. And I was like... (laughs) sold <laughs> you know <laughs> this is this is good because i i was just learning i liked historical at the time i mean i, I knew i liked it from joe bev but i hadn't looked you know really beyond that mm-hmm. but i was like but i know i like words so yeah. i'm down yeah and so i was like okay <laughs> so i went through and i was like oh this is good mm-hmm. and then I, i'd read like all of them um i haven't reread some of them but i remember liking this one because i was like this girl doesn't take anything from him. Mm-hmm. She's, I she's pretty solid in that. Really liked this book a lot, and I want to read the rest, but I didn't start them because I didn't want to get confused for this. <laughs> I, I thought I if I read, I was like, I've if I read three of them, because I finished, 
on like Tuesday last week. I read it really fast also. I was trying to read it slowly so it'd be fresh in my brain, but I really loved it and I read it really fast. And then I was like, oh, I really want to read the other ones, but I'm like, I can't because then I'm going to get the plot lines confused. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, and that's exactly what I did because I was like, wait a minute. Because I've got to read all three of them for the podcast and I'm recording them, you know, early in the month so that mm-hmm. way can I, you know, we can have time to do it. And I was just like, Okay, I know her first name. Which one was her last name again? Yeah, I know. I mean, I wrote down notes for their names. Because I was like, I remember who everyone is, but I don't necessarily remember everyone's name. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, exactly. I have, I'm I'm one of those people that I have like a, a spread, uh, not a spread, an outline for all my stuff. And so that's exactly what I did. And I've got like, okay, this person was this person. <laughs> yeah, this was this friend and this was this friend and... <laughs> Right, because I was like, I was reading so many of them so quickly that I was just like, wait a minute, because I've got like half of the last one to read. And so I'm just like, and I read them within a week. So I'm just like, I'm confusing myself. I probably (laughs) could have done that, but (laughs) I'm waiting. I can start again tomorrow. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I, because, and and I was glad you picked this one because I, I just, I loved Ellie, because I don't ever call her by her first name, because I can never say Elspeth. Oh, Elspeth? We can yeah, call her I'm Ellie. Saying, I'm, cool. Like... I'm cool with calling her Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Because I was like, you know what? Benjamin called her Ellie, and yeah. I'm going to call her Ellie. That's because I, fine. Like, I can say Ellie. Her friends' um, names, I know how to say two of them. I don't know how to say one of them. Let's see. I know Scorsia and Blair. <laughs> oh, Scorsia. I didn't know that. Okay, Scorsia. Yeah, I, that's that's what I call her. That's, I don't know if that's what it's supposed to okay. be. Okay, and then Rhiannon, obviously, because of the uh, Fleetwood Mac song. Everyone knows how to pronounce that. And <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm pretty sure the other friend is, um, I think that's pronounced Katrine, because yeah, that's what I was if you have say. an A at the end, that's how, they, how you spell Katrina in, like, uh, Scotch Gaelic. So I think it's Katrine. And- and there's um, the actress, I think this name is like Katrine. So she was Alice in the uh, sci-fi Alice. So okay, that's the only reason I know of those. But I was just like, Ellie? Yeah, Ellie sounds good. <laughs> Elspeth? I, I think it's pronounced I, Elspeth, but it's just hard to say with our American accents. <laughs> right. And it's like, it's and it's so much like Elizabeth that I'm like, my yeah. brain just wants to say Elizabeth yes. instead of Elspeth. And I'm just like... I'm not even going to try and say her mama's name. It was like Rose. Oh, gosh. I don't Rose even remember what it was. It was Rose something. something. Yeah. I was just like, you know what, Rosie? Rosie's fine. Mama Witch is fine. Um, <laughs> thankfully, Ben Westfield is pretty easy. <laughs> I was like, score. Ben. <laughs> At least I can Perfect. say his name. Not going to have some really, really long, hard to pronounce Scotch Gaelic name. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I was like, well, the he's the Englishman. so Yes. Thankfully, that was easy. But like, I I like the fact that like she was um very secure in herself. I liked her a lot. Yeah, yeah. I'm like she was really secure, and even with her her background of of you know being um hmm I I called it uh non fathered. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like having non father like she still was true to herself and her power, her healing power. I also think it was important to her and for her to be that way, that she had such a great support system of friends yeah, who were very, you know, love her no matter what, because they don't care. And I really liked, I mean, I love uh, witches and I especially love witches that are in covens. So I really loved the coven and, the support system they were and that it felt almost like they were sisters when you were reading it because they could have horrible arguments but still love each other yeah because there are sometimes that that uh katrine was brutal to ellie yeah she really there, was there were some comments that she made like i actually made notes of that one because i was like that's just why would you say that to your friend like mm-hmm. you know like uh, it was on like page 82 and it was like i scorcia told me I'm not saying this in the Spanish and this in the Scottish accent. Okay. Don't you think it's strange that he came looking for, you know, your mom, basically the last piece that came to these parts left her with a, with a baby to raise and no proper name to give either of you. Yeah. I thought that was, I was very like, mean. I was like, Whoa. Yeah. I, ma'am, if my, if my sister, which had told me that, mm-hmm. 
One of us would be buried. I did. Okay, so I did look ahead to see which of the Coven sisters had books. And so I did see that Katrine has one. And I think that I did feel like maybe some of her um, meanness <laughs> and yeah. was setting up her growth for her story. Yeah. I figured that that, because like Rhiannon was, we didn't really know her very well. And so, how do you say it again? Sorka? I was calling her Sorsha. 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 Um, I'm guessing because I'm like, you know what? I, I don't know. like Sorsha with an I R. I should know. Like, I have a ton of very Irish friends who named their kids very Irish last names like names like this. But that I do not have a friend with a Sorsha or Sorka or however you say it. Yeah, exactly. I'm just like, I don't know. I liked her the most out of the friends. Yeah. My favorite, I did not take a ton of notes in my Kindle because I was reading too fast and I'd be like, oh no, I forgot. Um, I was supposed to be taking notes. But I did have a note uh, about her that I loved when um, she used her, her like earth power on Ben and he said, yes, he yeah, never, anything. when he says, <laughs> he never that. heard of one using botanical manipulation as a weapon before. I love that line. <laughs> Yes, I had I had the same like I had that same thing and I was like poison ivy. Yeah, so cute. And <laughs> was I life. was a little sad to see that she doesn't get a book unless does she get a book in a different series? She she does. Um, there are so there's multiple series. There's okay, the Westfield Wolves, and then there's also the Gentleman Vampires. So she and gets a vampire. She's... Okay. <laughs> And so she's in there, but and, and like you know how she's like in love with the lichens, but yes, okay, that makes sense then because I was sad when I didn't, I didn't know if those two series were like very connected or like loosely connected. Yeah, Ryan, oh, okay. um, I'm actually reading her book now. She's a vampire. She's with a vampire. Wait, well, Rhiannon no, is got done reading hers, and and Blair has got a vampire as well. Oh, okay, good to know. Yeah, they're in the series. They're just kind of like interspersed a little bit. Okay. Uh, so I actually did some research on this because I didn't realize it. It was a source books thing, and they sold them in, in like, blast of three books. Okay. Um, three of the books came out, like, you know, back to back to back, and then they filled in the gaps, and then the other ones came back to back to back. So, okay. And then there's, like, eight or nine books in the series. I don't know if it was finished because, like, they the the books literally, like, the – it's a writing duo, and the books just disappeared. They're a writing – that Lydia Dare's a writing duo? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, Tammy Faulkner and Jody Pearson. Oh, interesting. Do they write separately uh, solo as well? Yeah. Well, Tammy does. I don't know if Jody does. I haven't been able to find anything. And I went to their Lydia Dare website, but it says, like, it's Tammy Faulkner and Ava Stone. So I don't know if Jody has Ava Stone as well. I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Because, like, there was a little bit of conflict, and, like, the website hadn't been updated since 2012. Oh, my gosh. That's a long time ago. Right, and it's and it's very like 2012 looking. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then I I try like I was trying to find information. I found like a link where, you know, um, I'll put it in the show notes about like it kind of gives you an, an introduction to the coven. Uh -huh. But like the the last review I could really find was from like 2012, from the fifth of the Westfield Wolves series. I wonder if they are writing under a new pen name and either writing straight paranormal or straight historical. Well, it looks like um, I think Tammy, Tammy was the paranormal side and Jody was the historical side. Mm -hmm. And they would, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth as they would write it in groups, from what I can tell. Because they went to RWA a couple times when these came out, but, like, I haven't seen anything since then, really. I emailed um, Tammy and I was like, hey, you know, I just want to let you know, like, I'm, I'm doing a series on this because, you know, it's been a decade, but what you did actually was really important to me. Yeah. Uh, it, it made a mark on me, you know, it's been a decade and I wanted to sit there and, and take a full month and really celebrate how diverse what you write were. Um, and it, it's um, diversity in the, in the characters and what they're doing, not necessarily what they look like. Yeah. Scottish and English. <laughs> English and Scottish. Yeah. <laughs> like, there, there's kind of like, you know, in the in the early, like, 2010s, there was a very branded um, idea of it. But I, I thought, that, you know, it was really nice. And actually, it's because of Lydia Dare I found Tessa Dare. Yeah, that's funny. You told me that before when we were talking. Um, I love Tessa Dare also. I find her books extremely comforting to read. But um, yes. I'm definitely going to read <laughs> more of uh, Lydia Dare's. 
yeah, it's like there's only I think like eight books or maybe nine books, mm-hmm. but like they're to me they were different and they were and they stood out because like there's not a lot of paranormal regency mm-hmm. romances. Like it, it's I'm like I don't know why because so many of the the um things overlap. Like you know a lot of the the writers that we follow on Twitter. <laughs> Yes. They would fit both places really well. I was trying to remember if I have ever read a Regency Paranormal before, and I don't think I have. I think I've read Paranormals that take place in the Regency era that are not romances. Yeah. But I can't remember a romantic Regency Paranormal. And I think it's a missing, like, grouping. I agree. Like, a a subgenre, or however you want to put it, like, because... I think that, like, there are so many things that would – think about how many dukes <laughs> would, oh would fit as a word or a dragon. <laughs> yeah, or, I could totally you know, get whatever. into that. It could be something. Also, like, Regency era England slash Highlands, Scotland's very atmospheric, which paranormals are very atmospheric, I feel like. So yeah. it goes hand in hand well together. And I I think it's something that – I I'm dying to find more of it. Mm-hmm. So call out to Twitter <laughs> if anyone. Is yeah, looking... I don't write historical, sadly, but I do write paranormal. But I do not. I don't know. I don't write historicals. <laughs> yeah, and I, I like I I would love to write it. I've there's one story I've been writing for years. I've never finished it. It was actually for one of my English classes. Uh-huh. It was creative writing because it was one of the classes I had to take to to graduate with it, and um. It was, it's a lesbian, uh, a lesbian, but it's like, it's not Regency, it's um, more medieval. Okay. Where the lead character is named Tallulah, after Tallulah Bankhead. Okay. Um, <laughs> and the, and the other character is Kate, and it's short for Catherine, okay. obviously after Hepburn. But it's one where they have to win the hand, and it's, she's got like two kingdoms. Okay. Obviously, I like history. Yeah. So she's got two kingdoms that she's going to be in charge of, but the Kate comes from an island nation, um, and Kate is a knight. Okay. So they're trying to win the hand, and so she shows up as a woman knight, and everyone's like, what? <laughs> and, you know, it just kind of like turns everything upside down. The, only, the one thing I've written, I haven't written half of it. But the one thing I really enjoyed writing it was the kissing scene mm-hmm. because it was in the upper towers of a um, of a castle. And it was more of like the snick snicked as the back of the dress kind of becomes a little bit more undone. And mm-hmm. it was really it, it, like it, it was something that I wanted to write, but I didn't necessarily know if it was my place. So I haven't done it because I'm quite heterosexual. Yeah, you could always just, I don't know. Try see what you, yeah. see what you think. I do and only it's write. It's more about spaces. It's more, it's more yeah. about spaces because I know a lot of queer authors don't have that space, so I don't know if I would necessarily be able to take that space. No, I totally get that. I only write straight romance, so because I am a, a straight a straight lady, so. And you know, we we go where our spaces are because, like I said, I don't want to take someone else's space. Yeah. Definitely, it's, definitely get it. It's, it's a conversation that's, that romance needs that has, and they keep having it. But yeah. I want to finish it just for me because I loved it. I agree. You should I, you should finish it just for you. I think that that's it's nice. To, I mean, I've written several, several, several books that will never see the light of day. <laughs> so, because like I I love I, I called her Lula. Uh-huh. Um, I loved Lula because Lula was a terrible person when it came to like you know, defense and stuff like that. Like she was, she was getting, um, taught by one of her cousins, uh, complicated, but like, um, you know, she was getting taught and, and the person teaching her, her instructor was a woman. Okay. So I thought that was important to have as well. Yeah. Yeah. To have, you know, a bunch of women be strong around her and show her how to be strong in a way, depending on the situation and what's going on. Um, and so I, I like the fact that, you know, Kate was very different from Lula. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I I like that kind of interplay of magic and fantasy a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, the realism more of, more of it because there was some of that going on in the story that I wanted to build into it. But, you know, I they're just I like to see when subgenres go together. Right. Mm-hmm. Like not like not just like one or the other, but like just, because our lives are not 
they're not straight lines mm -hmm. like they're not you know one thing one thing like there's too many intersectionalities in our life not to have some in what we're reading and enjoying and and devouring yeah as it were when it comes to some of this stuff well and paranormal and regency are two that i feel like are easily mixed together <laughs> so mm -hmm. oh yeah mixed together well <laughs> again duke and alpha they're basically the same right they really are and most a lot of dukes are grumpy <laughs> so yeah a lot of werewolves are grumpy <laughs> more than enough yeah <laughs> They're either grumpy or puppies. <laughs> <laughs> so they're going to be like, um, uh, you haven't met them yet, but when you meet Dashiell Thorpe's brothers, he's got twin brothers. Okay. <laughs> you can't get away from twins no matter what you do, apparently. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> twins just make up your life. Twins are everywhere. Um, <laughs> but but um, it's, it's really nice how you meet them more in uh, – how did you say her name? Rihanna? Uh, Rihanna. Rihanna, yeah. Um, you see her, they see them a lot more because that's part of the coven meeting in London. But um, it's got that same, you know, you've got the older sibling and then the, the younger ones. And it, it's just, it's, it's nice to see that kind of stuff in the paranormal and the Regency kind of com combined and collide and, mm -hmm. and and seeing how they kind of interact with other people that are in the same age range. Because that's one thing I liked about the coven was, you know, each one of them were roughly the same age. Mm -hmm. Poor floral <laughs> Scorcia was Scorcia. She's was, the youngest, um, right? Yeah, she was the youngest. But, like, the rest were kind of roughly the same age. And actually, in Blair's book, you find more about the coven, too. Okay. How old yeah. was Elsie? Did they ever give her an exact age? I think she was around 20. 20, because I think um, they said Ben was 29, right? Yeah, he was He was quite a bit older. But, I mean, that's... Which kind of made me go, oh. Yeah, I think... <laughs> it wasn't... It's not nearly as bad as some of the other ones in the series. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like as long as it's not, like, 17. I feel like once the... If the, if the heroine is 19, I'm like, okay. <laughs> well... <laughs> In Blair's book, I'll say that um, there's a age difference of roughly 600 and something years. So. Okay. That's okay. I was a huge fan of Buffy and Angel. And they were like 300 yeah, years they, apart. Yeah. It's it's like twice, twice the Buffy and the Angel type stuff. But it's good, I think, for that. Uh, no, that's not Blair. That's um, Rihanna. Yeah. But Blair is like around like... Around Buffy and Angel, actually. So okay. You'll fit right, right in with that age range. Well, now I want to read the one where there's a 600-year-old vampire living in the Regency, because that means he saw, like, the fall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> well, I he, guess, no, he, he was didn't. Made, if he's no, 600. he was made during the Crusades. Yeah, Crusades. That, that, my math was incorrect. He would have been, it would have been, like, early Middle Ages. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I think it's like I think it's like you know the second crusade. I don't think it's the, the third one. Okay, but yeah, he he was made during that time. But he shows up um in Katrine's book apparently as well. Okay, so, as a minor character, so they do a really good job of weaving all these these things together. But like, I like the fact that there was um a lot of secret society. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot. Well, then these, because <laughs> you've got like the Lycan Society that no one knows about, and you have the Coven. <laughs> you know what I liked no about the Lycan about. Society? The Lycan Society sort of reminded me in like most historicals you read now, like the Lisa Kleepas and the Sarah McLean, how the men always be belong to like a club. Yeah. And the Lycan Society seemed like it was like a gambling club. Like, I'm just going to the club for the evening, even though yeah, all, everybody in my club's a werewolf. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You're, you're just going to whites. Yes, that's what it For felt like. Reason. It felt very much like whites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, it's, it's nice because you're like, okay, but how many, I, I wanted, to, I always want to know more about like, how many lichens really are there? Yeah. Because, I mean, it builds upon like, if you think about just slightly more, like, are they the reason for the cause of the whole like, you know, Queen Victoria? <laughs> having a werewolf for you know like how does that fit in okay so an interesting thing i found with this one in particular is and it might have been because i went right straight in with book two yeah so as far as i could tell in this universe lichen is genetically inherited yes so there is no like werewolf attack yep but 
is it also like if Ben were to attack someone in werewolf form, would they become a werewolf or they would just die? <laughs> You know, I I don't remember because it's been so long since I read the first one. Okay, because I figured in the first one, because I know in the first one, since just for me in the blurb, that she, the heroine, whose name I don't remember, is not in the magical world. So I assume there's yeah. a lot more explaining. Yeah, and I think there's a little bit more, too, in the third book. Um, okay. The Wolf Next Door, is, which is really interesting, too, because it's like, that's really good if, you if, if you know, people want to read about, like, um... Uh, lost loves and childhood loves. I and love that. Second chances. I love second chance romance. That's a really good one because I lo- her name is Prissa, I think, but I call her Prissy because that's what they call her in the book, and uh-huh. it's amazing. Like it's, it's very much that style of you know not taking any gruff, and she doesn't know about the the lichens either. Okay. So it's 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 got a nice little balance to that, and um, I I like that kind of style. Because one thing that I, the one thing I really appreciated about this book is when Ben couldn't change and he had to go find the coven, Mm -hmm. you know, at the behest of the major forester, I appreciated the fact that it almost read more like, it read a little bit more like PTSD or something to that, to that ability of, of being afraid of being who you are because of what you can do. Yes. I have in my notes. I love that in this book, being a werewolf is like a positive part of his identity. And it's not like, oh, thank God I'm rid of the curse, which I feel like most werewolf books, if it's not a shifter book, if it's like a straightforward werewolf book, it's such like a curse. Like I have this curse on my soul. And I love that it was not looked at that way. And he was like seeking out this missing part of himself to return to his whole person. Yes. And I love that because he was very clearly secure in his identity the same way that she was. Yeah. Right? Like they weren't trying to, to change themselves yeah. Yeah. to fit the other one, right? Yes, and how and, she was very much like, I am a healer. This is who I am. I'm not going to stop, even if it's dangerous. Like, I really exactly. liked that part of her. They both had those magical parts of themselves that they couldn't give up and they weren't going to for someone else. And that was, I think, so important because a lot of times you see, you know, in that time frame and a little bit before where the women would be willing to give themselves up Mm -hmm. a little bit. And, And to me, this reminds me a little bit, again, of Jo Beverly. Because there were several characters in her that even though sometimes I want to cry because I have the issues with her now, you know, things like Alfred and Diana and these are women that never apologize for being who they were. Mm-hmm. And even even Felicity's book in um, Dangerous Joy, mm-hmm. uh, there were some parts that were just kind of like, Wah. but one thing that really worked was Felicity never apologized for the situation she was in and the things that she needed for it. Uh-huh. Right. And I love that. I love a woman that is definitive and on who she is like to me that's a strong character and a strong woman Mm -hmm. because i know there was a debate back in actually during this time where what is a strong woman that's such an empty hollow thing but it's not it's strength is depending on what the character in the and needs to be Mm -hmm. you know like blair is strong because she's a battle-born witch and she's confident in what she can do yeah you know same same with weather witch i mean they each have their own strengths yeah and and they're definitive in that and, and who it is and who they are and mm-hmm. they don't really use it against each other. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Blair was ready to absolutely <laughs> literally light up Ben when he was pissing off her friend. Yeah, yeah. And lightning is very um, hardy as a weapon. Yes. Lethal. You know? It can be very lethal. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be, and you can almost switch it was mm-hmm. with what can be done with it. And, you know, they, they all know who they are. And even, like, Katrina's, like, a seer, it's still – her word is law in that yeah. coven because of what she sees. That that's the, – the power is passive, but her – her power within the group is not. That's actually how you just said that, that her word is law is a really good way of describing her power in the group because she doesn't have this like outward power. 
but she's kind of the queen of the group anyways. And that's why everyone is drawn to her. Even like Alec McQuarrie. I don't remember his last name, but I remember Alec. Yeah, I I just remember it because it comes up in other books that I've been reading. He's he's deeply tied to it, even though he doesn't know what the coven is for most of the time. Wait, does he have, is he in other books? Yeah, he's in other books. He's throughout. Oh, interesting. Because, okay. because he's been friends with them for a very long time, so he's very tied to their Edinburgh roots. Okay, so I wasn't certain if he was just like a fixture for this book as like a an easy way for him to be in Edinburgh, <laughs> like an easy way for Ben to be in Edinburgh. Oh yeah, no, I mean like he's he's got a long history with them, and you know he's obviously in love with Katrine. But yes, he's deeply tied to to the book series when it comes to the coven. Okay, interesting. Some of the other ones, maybe not so much, but the coven's for sure. Okay. He, he kind of, like, pops up throughout. Is he a vampire? I'm not going to say. Okay. <laughs> I guess but... I'll just have to read them all. <laughs> yes, you will. Um, I, I will say that it's his loyalty, even when he feels that he's been lied to at certain points, is phenomenal oh well that's good to know i look forward to yeah that. I mean, he's he's a very worthy character okay interesting um, yeah and like he he loves them for who they are without knowing what they are okay i like that you know and and, and you got that and you can even get that through this book yeah right? you definitely like, get like the loyalty vibe from him like, like he's he's gonna defend ellie even though ben is his very best friend right yeah, like yeah. It, it doesn't matter like Ellie is important not just to Katrine, but to the community around him, and he sees that and he realizes that. Yes. And and I feel like that's something that sometimes gets forgotten, you know? That, like, you know, women and men can be friends without it being anything more than that. Yes, and I love when authors write a good male-female friendship, because I think it's hard, right, or even in movies or TVs, because I think it's hard to do, and I think a lot of times especially in tv and movies like you'll start out writing a really good friend but then there has to always be something romantic so i always appreciate a well-written friendship between a man and a woman well and like you were you were mentioning the mark thing and no one had noticed you know i guess that um she had it except for her coven Mm -hmm. but i think that that the the wolf mark that that she gets because she it comes up in the book because obviously this is going to be a spoilery podcast because yes. that's just how I roll. <laughs> um, but there's something very valuable in their friendship because mm-hmm. he's he's not scared of her, but he's also he respects her. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. And again, like you said, it's not always available, and I think that's a pity because I think it's probably the most important thing because. We all have friends. Like, we all don't have an insular, you know, this is my friend because she's a girl. Yeah. Right? Like, you, you have friends because of what they bring to you and what they value. And throughout my life, I've had some amazing male friends who have helped me and just as much as the the women did. Yeah. And I, I think that this book does a really good job of balancing that. It does. Of demonstrating the value of it. For the second book in a series, that's kind of awesome, honestly, too. <laughs> You don't always get that in, in longer series. So there were two things in the book that I didn't like. Can we talk about those? Yes, let's. <laughs> I have a few myself. Only two. So the first one I didn't care for, but I totally understand why it was used as a plot device. But I really didn't like this, like, throwaway random prostitute that oh. Ben injured. And the building of the foundation of kind of like the word of the whore. Yeah, I don't, okay, this is what bothered me. It bothered me that, like, he really scared her. He obviously hurt her. They talk about that. And obviously he has this overwhelming reaction that he can't change. And it changes, like, the core of his being. But it it bothered me more, I think. It bothered me at the beginning that she was just, like, this random person. It bothered me more when his brother was, like, comforting him, like, she was fine. We paid her off. She has all this money now. She was fine. That really bothered me. Yes, me and you both. I have lines about that. It left a bad taste in my mouth. I understand that they wanted him to do something violent that so so that he would be afraid he'd hurt Elsie. I get that as the as a plot point. 
but I really just didn't like, even without the whole thing about him saying she was just a random whore, like whatever that was annoying. But also again, I understand that it was like something that they needed to work through because of people calling her mother that and like Mm -hmm. her whole childhood being surrounded, being, you know, dominated by that word. But I just really didn't like the, she was fine. We paid, we paid her a ton more money. That like really bothered me. It just really bothered me. She might've been a prostitute, but she did not sign up to be injured badly. Right. And the thing is, is like, he, he said, like, he went back to her and like, oh, she was so happy. I'm like, yeah, because you basically enchanted her with money. Yeah. The same way a vampire enchants with, you know, a stare or whatever. Yeah. So that, that bothered me. And, you know, I get it. And I get the whole, like, I don't know. I did think there was like a little bit, it was a little heavy on the, on the prostitute side characters. Just in terms of like, like classist. Here are these throwaway women, which I understand. It's Regency. Your dukes, dukes are always, you know, screwing a bunch of women before they meet their the love of their life. So they're good at sex when they meet the love of their life. But I felt there was like a little bit too much of it with um. And now I'm gonna forget his name with Ben's brother. Was it Simon? No, not Simon. Yeah, Simon. Simon. Uh, Simon was the older one, I think. Yeah. Okay, so with Simon, he was the one that came. Yeah. It's Simon, Will, and Ben. Okay, yeah, so Simon. How he was, like, in bed with the maid, and then he had to ride ahead because he needed he needed a prostitute. And I just, it was, like, a little bit much for me. I yeah. get it. He's going to be great at sex in his book, but it just got, like, I don't know. Well, and I think that was actually Will, but, like. Oh, was um, it Will? Simon, okay. Si- Simon is the one that hammered into his head, you know, like, you never go with a woman during the full moon. Oh, okay, no, I'm thinking of Will, then. Will's the one that I'm thinking yeah. of. I just yeah. flipped him in my and brain. Will's story is in the next story. That's Prissy's book. Okay. And there, there's a lot there, I think. But, like, there's actually a lot there that needs to be discussed, too. Because, again, it, it, there, there's a lot of things with these books talk about psychological things without talking about them. Mm-hmm. But I I didn't like the whore thing at all. And I'm saying the word whore because that's what he called. Yeah, it's in the book. I, I did not appreciate it because it took – it took something that was a valid form of work mm-hmm. and someone that wanted something that would offer money in a time where, I mean, this is like the Regency, which means the Napoleonic Wars just ended. Yeah. Money was hard to come by. Yeah. And these people had a ton of money to spend. Mm-hmm. There's another oh. book I read recently that I can't remember what it was called, but there's something about a, a woman's like, I'll be fine on my own. I'll be fine on my own. And someone says like, you're going to end up being a prostitute. And she's like, no, I won't. And the other character says something to the effect of no one wants to be a prostitute when they start. Like, and that's something to unpack in terms of this time, the time period we live in contemporary time period and sex work versus you know, uh, Regency prostitution, which obviously is very different. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't appreciate the horror moniker, right? Yes. Because I think it's just so. It's demeaning. Under It's demeaning, but and it, and it also undervalues Ellie as well because of what, again, like, you know, what she had gone through and I like my, my favorite part was actually, I actually made a note of that where she just slapped the holy hell out Yeah, of him. I like that a lot. I also think it's interesting because, you know, how he uses the word whore to describe a sex worker, but people used the word whore to describe her mother for sleeping with one guy ever and getting pregnant. Right. So it's it's just like, it's in itself, it's a very demeaning word. It doesn't describe a profession. It just describes how he and feels that. about the character of the person. Exactly. And, you know, in the, um, in the vampire series, there is actually a, um, uh, I think they called it a brothel in the, in that book, but where the vampires go. And because uh, when a vampire bites you, it's climatic. Oh, and okay. yeah, but there's like, but, but the brothel is different in the way that, you know, necessarily say like, um, Sarah McLean's would be with grace. Okay. Right. Like, but it's the same idea, but there's different, there are different, 
setups and and how you treat the women right because like the um the characters in that series the vampires in, in this series obviously but the it's like a three series they're very different okay like they have they have humanity like they, they refuse to lose their humanity okay they're like just because i'm a vampire does not mean i should be something other than what i am which is a human at the base of it mm-hmm. but and i feel like in when when ben was talking about having sex with the worker that there was something very like low class about it and class yes very Again. much and I was just like, like she uh-uh. was so beneath me, I could just like brush her away like a piece, like dust. Right, like literally the 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 sex worker could be a maid, like Will was talking about. You know, like you're you're missing something very important there. And I think that, you know, at some some point back, I guess about a third way through the book, you know, Ellie says when he notices her mark, you know, Ellie is flat out says. I didn't realize I owed you an explanation about anything else, Ben. You're the one who sought me out. I loved that so, line so much. So I was like, why? Like, why does a woman owe something to a man just because? And I think that Ellie does a good job of setting up how definitively defiant some of the the elements of the, of the coven are. And I love that. Well, I also love that because... She doesn't have to tell him her secrets. She owes him nothing. He's, right. He needs her help. She does not need him. She does not need his help. She's not looking for a werewolf bodyguard or anything like that. He nope. needs a magical healer. She doesn't have to divulge anything to him. And she, even knowing what she knows, she still offers to help him. Mm-hmm. And I think that's different. That's... I keep on saying the word definitive, but like there's so many defining traits in this book that sets up the, the, the coven, but also each of the women in them. And for her, hers is being a healer means you heal. You don't discriminate. Yes. You know, unlike him. Yes. I really like that way of saying that. And, and I think that those kind of lines are why I remember these books. Yeah. Because as, you know, in 2000, I was late 20s. I was slowly coming into my own sexuality and what I wanted and what I wanted to accept because I had been delayed with other things going on in my life. And I I remember being impressed with Ellie specifically. I remember her specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, enough that I bought the book on Nook when it was on sale, like, and I hadn't opened my Nook in about eight years. So, <laughs> you know, it was one of the first books I bought in my Nook. Um, and so I was just like, I, I need this. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I needed these characters. I needed someone like this. And I needed someone that was like, okay, you're powerful. I'm just as powerful in another way. What do you want to do about it? Yes. And I think that as, you know, <laughs> not just 2020, but I think in the past, I guess, you know, decade, we've been, there's been a constant fight for that. And there was a constant fight before her because obviously the writers came up with her from not out of the ether. Like there was something in, in the air then as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. I like it when I can champion the women in the book and the women are solid within themselves, but also outside of themselves. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that I always want to look for. And that's actually why I created the podcast. So it makes sense to me. I really like that you never feel throughout the book that Ellie needs Ben. Like she wants him and she loves him. But even when like she, you know, he's being a typical, you know, thick headed romance hero and not admitting that he loves her or is falling in love with her. She realizes that. You know, she's going to be really sad and she's going to miss him, but she can live without him. Mm-hmm. And I like that a lot, too. And it'll hurt her, but it's not. It won't break her. Going to, yeah, I was going to say, it's not going to hinder her. Yeah. Like, you know, she's used to her. She can get on with that. And, you know, when she goes to find her father, because it's something that's really bothered her and now she's got a position to do it. I mean, even as his wife, she's like, okay, I don't have to go with you. Mm -hmm. There are, I have brother-in-laws that can handle this. I have, 
a whole new society I didn't even know existed that can help me find these answers. It's not integral to you finding this for me. Okay, so the I father brings us to the one other thing I didn't like about this book. The the father? Okay, it wasn't necessarily the father, but like I was sort of, and it might have been just the mood I was in, but when Katrine gets attacked by a wolf, and it turns out mm-hmm. to be a real wolf, I'm like... Right. In my brain, like, oh, it's Elsie's dad. And Elsie's dad's an evil wolf. And Elsie's going to have to stare him down and there's going to be a big battle. So I was getting, like, myself all jazzed up for that kind of plot. And, and it wasn't. It was just so a- I felt it a, a little bit of a letdown that her her dad was just, like, this man who was like, I didn't know you existed. Like, I wanted it to be a little bit more than that. And I think that, actually, the, the duo, the writing duo, do a better job of that in the vampire series. Okay. Than what they necessarily do in the wolves. Because I feel like the wolves are the setting up for the vampires. Because I felt like when I was reading the book and, like, they got married and they're falling in love and, you know, Ben's still not, you know, admitting that he's in love with her. But there was still a lot of book left. Mm -hmm. And so I was preparing myself for, like, a really great arc having to do with her dad because I felt like the romantic arc had already kind of... Like, obviously, it doesn't, it's, it's not in how they write it. it. It has a lot more to be wrapped up. But I thought that the the the, the end of the book was going to be much more like, uh, like Solid. dangerous wolves. <laughs> so, yeah. But it wasn't. <laughs> and, and instead of um, them having to kind of go over their stuff. So earlier today uh, on Twitter... <laughs> This, I don't know who this guy was. He was just like, here's how to write you the five pillars of romance. And he used Pride and Prejudice. I'm like, oh my god. Really? You think that's romance? I mean, it is romance, but it's not a de- defining trait of romance anymore. No, it's a, I, oh, it's like, I don't know. Like, I love Jane Austen so, so, so much. I adore Jane Austen. I do not pick up a Jane Austen novel when I want to read something romantic. <laughs> Right, I mean, like I have to admit, I really don't like Jane Austen. I, I, I've tried to. I read Pride and Prejudice a couple times, and I just, I have, I have issues with class. I guess because, so growing up, I had my godmother had a lot of money, and my parents did not. Like my parents were working class. My godmother was, you know, upper middle class. So I was exposed to things that I wouldn't have been if I had. You know, mm-hmm. so I, I just I have a lot of class issues, and I fully am aware of this. Hence, why my class issues with with the sex worker. Yeah. But like I I, I so Bev Jenkins tweeted it, and I read it, and I was just like, "Are you kidding me? <laughs> no. You would probably <laughs> but... prefer Sense and Sensibility. I would probably prefer anything else. Like, but yeah. like he." He, you know, was talking about how it's romance or blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, okay, but no. Well, that's okay. There's a lot of things that don't really sit with the modern romance. Well, that's also like saying, here are the five pillars of contemporary fiction and using war and peace. Like, it's not modern. (laughs) Like, it's, okay. I mean, it was written in the Regency (laughs) during it. And like you know, bless her, Jane Austen was also critiquing more of her social. Yeah, I, social think of, I think of Jane Austen is more of like commentary on on society at the time than romance. Right, like the romance was almost secondary. Yeah, it definitely is in all of them. I'm just like thinking about all of them in my head right now, and it's secondary in pretty much all of them. Right, because it's like it's more of a a blasting of the social classes that didn't realize they were being blasted necessarily. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, um, and it's necessary, but sometimes things get a little bit too pat. And I felt like sometimes the father in this book was a little bit too pat and a little bit too easily um, slotted into the series. Yeah, because I, I feel I like there was, there, there was missing a little bit. Like, like you go from having no father to finding the father to being a daddy's girl. All yes, time. that bugs me a lot. Other like thing a couple that, months max. Another thing that like, super bugs me is, okay. So they've made a big deal about her father didn't know her mom was pregnant. He doesn't have any other kids that he talks about. So we can assume, unless this guy has a sister who is his best friend, he's never been around pregnant women. But yet he tells Ben that Ellie must be pregnant from her 
symptoms. That drove me nuts. And she wasn't even like, and she was like very early pregnant too. Yeah. Because like I've, I've been pregnant. <laughs> it didn't last, but I've been pregnant. So I understand these steps that come, come with it. Right. And they were making it seem like she was like, sometimes like four months pregnant. And I don't know if like the werewolves have, you know. Oh, different gestations. Uh, they can. Right. I read books where they do. Oh yeah. So have I. But in this series, it doesn't feel like that's what's going on. It feels like the lichen is something that comes out, like, and, and it's part of them, but it doesn't really form until, like, that last week before the full moon. Yeah. A, a bit like, you know, I was somewhat was like, is this their PMS and period at once? Anyway. Uh, well, also, <laughs> like, the whole thing is that I, I can't remember what the symptoms are. Her symptoms are like, she's mad at him, and she threw up yeah. once. It's like, you know right. what? I've been mad at my husband and thrown up and not been pregnant. <laughs> right. I'm like... If you get me emotionally angry, I'm going to probably throw up. I don't throw up easily, but if I am that un- under that much stress, I'm probably going to puke on you. Also, it's or the something. Regency. She could have eaten a bad mushroom. <laughs> like, just stuff like that. It could have been bad bread, considering. Bad water, <laughs> bad bread. Was. Something's going around the town. She is a I healer. Mean, She's going to catch and, stuff. Well, and we've seen her, like, she lived in basically a shack, so. Not great living conditions. There's probably a lot of mold. It wouldn't be out of it if she had some mold every once in a while in her bread and her cheese. And not the good kind of, like, blue cheese mold. Like the bad kind that makes you vomit. Exactly. Or die. (laughs) Right? The kind that makes you need a chamber pot very, very quickly. Yes, yes. And so, like, it just, that that kind of felt a little bit pat. Yeah. I was like, that, that was like... That and <laughs> when I rated the book, I gave it a four out of five because I also got annoyed by all the Scottish. And what I mean is, it's like it happened all the time instead of like you know making it to be an important thing when it happened. That's all she talked with. Yeah, I didn't, and I was like I, at the beginning, it bothered me. I got kind of accustomed to it as reading. I'm not a crazy fan of writing out accents phonetically. I feel like if you yeah. tell someone we're in edinburgh and she's from edinburgh i know what she her voice sounds like right or like you know it you you get the basic idea but it doesn't sound english it sounds very scottish like and not highlands but like standard scottish of what you think of you know like you think of people like um like david Tennant and stuff like that like you know that noise yeah you know, you the, know the voice you don't need you think about Lander, you know the voice Right, and so it's like it just felt a little bit unnecessary at times, mm-hmm. especially when you had like all five witches together, for instance. Yes, and you're just like, and Alec in the in the mix, and you're just like, can one of you just vaguely stop for five seconds so I can figure out who is saying what? Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes they, they got a little bit indistinctive when it came to their groupings of like five of them at once. It was sometimes difficult to tell whose voice was whose when there were a lot of them together. But that's, yeah. that's something I know that's difficult no matter what in ter- when you're writing like a large group of people. But the accent didn't help. Yeah, it's like you could have just said, yelled in a Scottish brogue and we would have been like, I got you. Got it. Page one. Got this person is Scottish. Keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> or every once in a while have like you know the scottish and the english um kind of battle each other out in their in their voices when they're angry yeah because you know when i get very angry i sound very southern mm-hmm. um I, I, like i'm talking about like i sound like angela from 90 day fiance uh-huh. southern oh my god i love um, angela <laughs> <laughs> Like, I have so many issues with Angela, but I've lived where she is. She's so, so I entertaining. To... <laughs> I, I. My I husband mean... did not watch that season with me. And I'm like, you, we have to go back. Because he's watching the current season with me. I'm like, we have to go oh, back. Oh, she's watching Happily Ever After too. No, we're, so no, we don't watch, we only, so right now we're watching 90 Day Fiance the other way. But it's the one that's on TV here right now. So I don't know if you would have gotten it yet. Well, well, no, we're watching like, so. God bless YouTube, because that's how I've been watching it. So okay. Like, but, like, Happily Ever After is the one that has a tell-all right now. Okay. Um, yeah, and so I've been watching the I, – I've been watching it because I'm just like, these people are crazy, and they make me seem smart, and I other weight, and I'm still better than these people. I, that's why I watch 90% of the TV I watch. 
<laughs> because you feel better about yourself? I feel way better about myself. I used to always watch, I had to stop though. I used to always watch the shows where like the moms have so many kids. Cause I'd be like, my life's under control. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then you're like, yeah, no. <laughs> I'm like, this is, I don't have 19 kids. I can do the laundry. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. I, I also watch Love After Lockup. I have not watched that. Oh, it's by the same people that are 90 Day Fiance. Okay. That should tell you about the batshit level on that one. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah it's like it's like 90 day but it's more like you know your boyfriend gets out of jail mm-hmm. one, one of the, one of the characters uh one of the i, I say characters because the way the storylines were written but yeah. like one of the people is like a a mormon who had who got pregnant in the prison closet with her boyfriend who was in the prison was her boyfriend a guard how did that work no her boyfriend was a was a felon in the prison. Apparently Wait, it was a co ed prison? Guard. Oh Apparently no, she's not a prisoner. Oh no, he was a prisoner. He's, He's the prisoner. prisoner, she's not a prisoner. No. Okay. She's the woman outside the prison. Okay. Well, yeah, but apparently she did that, and yet she's surprised because he's from Compton and he wants to stay in Compton and doesn't want to go to Utah. <laughs> okay. Um, like, he's from Compton and you want to go back to Utah. Yeah. I mean. Well, I'm bad. <laughs> There are a few differences in these key statements here. I know. But, like, you know, I, I can see where, like, your accent or your attitude can come from, right? Like, and so that's that's what I, I wanted to – that's what I see more of. As you read more of the books, you see more of that in the series mm-hmm. where you can definitely see, like, the – the context of where they're from, when they're from, yeah. depending on if they're a vampire or not. And you can see, like, how they um create their own – foundation okay i had to take middle english in college as part of my major and i had to speak it with an accent for one of my assignments so i still know how to speak like a paragraph with an accent and i would love it if one of these vampires had one of those weird middle english accents (laughs) that sound ridiculous (laughs) they they sound pretty modern for, for the year you know for the regency but they um they have a lot of the sensibilities of whenever they were from. Okay, that makes sense. So, like, um, up your witch, we have to burn you. Again, 650 years old. Mm-hmm. He was knighted by, like, one of the kings. I, oh, right, no, it was Richard the Lionheart. He was going into ballad with Richard the Lionheart. Okay. And one of the coven ancestors actually. Uh, gave him a gift because he saved her life or whatever or no she saved his whatever um and so he got a gift for that out of it um and that connects to some of the other vampires in the, in the series and then another one was a baron that lived on his land on or not on the land but like next to the to the adjacent property okay to um the original vampires so it's this whole thing but it's very interesting because it's it's nice to see like the different levels of where they're from. Mm-hmm. I really hope he says night connect because that's how you're <laughs> supposed to say it. <laughs> I would know because I I was thinking I was like okay I can take this class. It was linguistics and I was like no I can't. <laughs> nope. I barely understand French. I was taking French at the time too. I was like, no. My roommate at the time says she still can like hear me practicing like the doctor hour floor. <laughs> I tried that first day. He wanted me to like be able to like. It's so phlegmy. <laughs> well, so he, but he want he wanted us to know how to speak like old English, Middle English, and modern English like in the first like week. Yeah. I was like, okay, hold on. Can we go over our names again first? Because he wants to be able to, like, say our names in Middle English or whatever. Mm. I'm like, is my name Tolkien? No, then no, thank you. Teach it to me first. Yeah. Middle English, the big thing is you pronounce every single letter. Yeah, see? That was the big thing. Is like, connect. Like, I'm not even saying it completely correct right now. But you have to pronounce the K, the N, the I, the G, the H, and the T. <laughs> You know, that actually sounds a little bit like German over here. So a lot of people say that Middle English sounds like a mix between English and German. Yeah, I can see that because, like, learning how to speak over here, I discovered that there are, like, 
like you say the P and the F together. And I was like, no, you don't. You pick one or the other. Yeah. You have a P, you have a pan, or you have a fan. Uh You don't get both. Yeah. You don't get a fan. You get A or B. Sorry, I just had a big beep go off that lets me know that my my door opened downstairs. My kids probably just went outside. (laughs) Okay. No, that's good. Sorry about that. You know... It's good. It's good to know when your kids are safe. My husband's with them, so they're fine. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's good to know when your kids are safe when he's not here. If he's got to go pick up the groceries, for instance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's good to know they know where they are. It makes sense to me completely. I'm a fan of knowing where children are running around at, especially when you have ones under certain ages, because you like to know what they're. Running. I like to know where they are. It's very dark here now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know the feeling, but yeah, I like this series because it's very, um, it's got a very strong world building considering, you know, you've got the paranormal and you've got the Regency, mm-hmm. but you can see a little bit of here and a little bit of there. Yeah. You can see how this kind of like woven together a bit. And I know that, um, one of the partners, Tammy Faulkner, she writes, um, she's written some things like a, um, I think she said like Fay Regencies. Ooh. I haven't read them because I didn't. I didn't realize, you know. That sounds. But funny. like I was reading it, and I was like, oh. So she's got like Fay <laughs> in the Regency. They're not part of this world, but she's you know got her own. Where, yeah, you know, the there's a definitive like crack in you know the the Fay stay with the Fay, the mm-hmm. humans stay with the humans, but then occasionally they kind of like fall through. I like that a lot because that's very. British Isles folklore. Yeah, and that's that's why I thought like I would. That's why I, that's why I liked her in this world a little bit too, because you could see the um, you could see where if they had continued continued to write, there would have been a very strong world for mm-hmm. many different creatures they could have brought into it. Yeah, because it's very obvious that like when you read the vampire books, you can almost see like the un the unsated fae that could have appeared out of that, and I love that. I love folklore. Me too. So to me, I was like, oh, please give me all of them. Give me these books right now. Write them. <laughs> right? Because I was like, I, I'm i so in love with that kind of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I wish that they had kind of created more along the way because there was some things you could build off of. And, with, and especially with your background, I'm sure this would have been like, more than catnip if they'd continue to build it too yeah definitely and i do tend to be the type of person that like if i read a book i like i read them all immediately (laughs) oh yeah because like you you have to you have to know what's going on you have to know you have to know you have to know there are certain series i read though that i space out if i like them so much i only let myself read one a month to make it like last longer (laughs) i've never been very good at that i'm doing that right now with the bridgerton series because i really like it and I just I, started reading it this year, but I've been spacing them out to sort of give myself like, so that it lasts a year. <laughs> if you like them, I would totally recommend, um, there are some whistle down books that are like um, mm-hmm. anthologies that are outside of the, the other ones. But like, I know, I think Colin is one of them. Okay. Colin and Penelope are one of them. But um, if you read them, they're actually really interesting because- the whistle down, the lady whistle down is the binding element for all the other stories written by other people. So, like, it's set in the same world, basically, as as the Bridgertons without it being necessarily the Bridgertons. Oh, so does Julia Quinn write them or no? Yeah, she writes okay. all the, well, she, write, she writes, like, one book in each of the series. Okay. And then she writes the lady whistle down parts. Okay, okay. So she can, she maintains that narrative. It's just set in the same world. Oh, that's pretty cool. would be easily in. And I thought that was really interesting because I, I actually found Julia Quinn that way. Oh, interesting. Because um, it was like one of those, like, you know, going to the thrift store, finding these books for like 25 cents and reading them. And like, oh, and I realized, I was like, oh, wait, I read it because I read um the Viscount when Anthony's story. That's my favorite one so far. During, that's. I love <laughs> I that got book. It. <laughs> I read it during quarantine. Okay. And during my like four month, you know, vacation when I was having a lot of mental issues. And so that was one of the first ones I read. And I was like, oh, I've read this one before. And so now I'm having to, like, ignore some of my favorite romance podcasts because they're re- talking about the Bridgertons. And I'm like, but I can't read them. I can't listen to you because I want to know what happens. I know. I know. 
That is hard. Okay. Like, I have certain podcasts that I, like, obviously that I used to listen to before I was stuck in the house with my children 24 hours a day. But, like, I would have to skip. <laughs> Yeah, like I used to, I used to listen to uh, Not Your Mom's Romance Book Club, and I when they were doing like Penny Reed's new book, I'm like, well, I haven't read it yet. I can't listen to it <laughs> because I'd like to know what happens before I know. Yeah, what happens. gonna be spoiled. But then I do like sometimes if there's a book that like I really don't think I'm gonna like, but it's a book that like everyone talk is talking about. Then I can just listen to the, a podcast about it and be like, okay, <laughs> now I know. <laughs> I I have certain ones of those books, and I try not to talk about them too much on the podcast because I don't want to, like, alienate people. But sometimes you're just like, no, sometimes I need to know what's going on because of what's being talked about. Yeah. And it's not my thing, and so I don't want to give a negative review mm-hmm. of, of something I know someone else enjoys. Like I know so many people enjoy so much. Yeah. So it's, it kind of becomes a bit of a unpopular opinion without realizing it. Cause you can't, you don't really have the desire to read it. Yes. That's it's really just not going to make you happy. Also, like there are so many books to read. I don't want to pick up a book well, that I, I don't think I'm going to like. I know. Well, I I'm, I'm in the free book club now because i discovered over here that i was like oh they have overdrive they have libby they've got to have some some you know english books no like they have some but but no there are no books i want to read i'm sorry that's dangerous okay. I, I mean i find i find other solutions it's just because like i mean free books on on <laughs> nook and amazon are not a problem yeah <laughs> honestly i have one that's free <laughs> And what book is that? Well, the one that's free is not the series that I'm currently working on. But I do have a uh, series called that is um, called the Falling for You series. And the first book is free. It's called And Then It Was You. And this series I would pitch as obviously romance, light suspense. <laughs> not like <laughs> hardcore suspense, light suspense. Um, the series that I have that's perfect for this month that we're in right now is my holiday romance series. So my Halloween romance is called something wicked. And I, I don't think I ever introduced myself during this entire podcast. My name is Lucy Hudson. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I realized that, but I was like, go me. I've already written, I've already done the introduction where I'd say your name. <laughs> Perfect. I'm so glad you did that since I never said it. So hi, I'm Lucy Hudson. And if you are interested in a book that's basically like a Hallmark movie, Ode to Fall, but then has like a very explicit sex scene at the end, you might like something wicked, which is about a <laughs> New England woman who's obsessed with autumn and Halloween, and she meets a recent transplant who is from North Carolina, who's never been that into fall, and decides to take him on a month worth of dates to get him into the New England fall spirit. And it's very like food description heavy most of my reviews say uh you get very hungry while reading this book and you should probably have some sort of pumpkin pie apple fritter apple cider type bowl of chili even thing to uh get you through the book so you're not starving when you finish um and that's in my uh happy holiday romance series i also have the next book in that series is coming out on october 20th and that is a thanksgiving romance uh, so also a little fallish, but not spooky. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. Yes. Neither of them are scary. They are my cozy romance, but with explicit sex. So. <laughs> and see, you don't see my notes, but I was going to make you talk about this anyway, because that was at the beginning of the episode notes, but now it's more closer to the end, but still it's in there because I wanted to talk about that. Yeah, so those are... Because I've been talking you to Twitter for like over a year now, I think. Yes. So it's important. <laughs> so those are my books. I currently am working on a paranormal series, so I'm switching gears a little bit. I will continue writing in my Happy Holiday series, probably about a book or two a year, because they are novellas. So um, I'll, are good. I'll next year I'm planning to have two come out. We'll hope that that happens. But um, my main there, there work may right have, now. There may have been like a, a um, an issue with uh, content production in the past 
out of Yeah, so I was supposed to have two books come out in 2020, but that did not happen. I was supposed to have my Thanksgiving and my Christmas book come out this year, but um, in April when I was working on my Christmas book and the world fell apart, uh, it's very difficult to write a cheery Christmas romance in the be- at the beginning of a pandemic. <laughs> For you future know, reference, I, I, I don't know why. I know, and I high, even high drive, high energy, high love. Yes, woman. and even my kids were in heaven because I was cooking our favorite Christmas desserts, trying to get me in the mindset. I made lots of Christmas cookies in April, but I just couldn't wrap my brain around it. And thankfully, I had written the Thanksgiving one in January, so it was already done. <laughs> So my Christmas one's about halfway finished. Oh, barring catastrophic events, it should come out next Christmas. Fingers crossed. You know what? Don't don't say that. I know. Seriously, let me knock on some wood. Oh my god. <laughs> I mean, like I'm not overly superstitious, but um, sometimes I know. I know you don't I'll be fall able. Anything your way. I'll be able to get my summer romance out next year, next summer. That will definitely come out because that's, it's not as hard to write a summer romance. I have found that in the dead of winter in the Northern United States where I live, when it's so bleak, it's amazing to write a summer romance. (laughs) It's like going on vacation. So that will, uh, that will happen. That will be done, edited, everything ready to go next summer. (laughs) So but that makes sense too. Yes. I've I've been I've I've been to the to the Midwest before. Um it wasn't quite that. It was I think October, so it wasn't quite that. Yeah, cold, it's pretty nice here but... still then. Yeah, it was actually Michigan, so Okay. It was actually on Lake Michigan, so cuz I was telling you like my family's from that area, yeah. so The Great Lakes. I'm a Great Lakes girl and the Great Lakes are gorgeous in the fall. Oh, I agree. I um I saw it in spring, I think, too, a couple mm-hmm. times. Because, like, being in Atlanta, you don't actually get to go, go go to the Great Lakes that often. It's a bit of a drive. It's a kind of a hike, and you're much closer to the ocean. Yeah. My um my grandmother was sick, and so we were going to see that because my, my dad got married in July. We found out she was sick in that time frame, and then she passed away in August. But it's, it sounds sad, but it was nice because I got to see a really pretty time, I think, of the of the Great Lakes weather. So I thought it was like that was kind of like a nice balance to it. Yeah. And then I saw a couple of other times, but I was like, hmm. you know, if it wasn't cold most of the winter, I'd be okay. With yeah, I mean, if here. you're not here in January, February, and March, it's lovely. <laughs> Right. So you just need those three months elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, I'm <laughs> saying January, February, March. Last year on Halloween, we had an insane blizzard. I was going to say, I was like, didn't, didn't, wasn't there a blizzard? There was a crazy <laughs> blizzard on Halloween last year. My kids got to go to like three houses trick or treating because there was so much snow and it was 25 degrees. But that's very odd. The Halloween before, it was 65. And I'm hoping that's what it is this year. <laughs> hopefully yeah because you can like what you should do i was thinking about this actually you should have like little tables in your backyard like so they can go like trick-or-treating in your backyard yeah so i'm very lucky that my sister lives a block away so we can trick-or-treat at her house and my parents live in our town um and my neighborhood is adorable and um one of my friends who lives in the neighborhood we call her the mayor because she knows everybody and my (laughs) husband and i have decided we're going to pitch to her that instead of handing out candy, people put small goodie bags across, like socially distanced across their lawn. So kids can just come and grab one. And please remember to add those tiny little like travel sizes of hand sanitizer. Oh, yeah, seriously. Oh, if, if only we could get that stuff in the U.S. right now. <laughs> I know. Like my, so my father-in-law has a lot of medical issues so my so we get like the little 
the blue stuff. I call it the blue stuff. It's like the sanitizer, hand sanitizer. Okay. And so we get that every once in a while from my in-laws. And we're just like, my husband is in absolute heaven when those things are delivered to the house from my, my mother-in-law. Oh, yeah. Also, um, gloves. Yeah. Because he gets very, you know, careful about that. Even before the pandemic, they were still, like, doing that. I was very lucky that about... Four years ago, one of my children swallowed a foreign object and I bought medical gloves and I could only buy a hundred pairs. So we are still working through that. (laughs) So I felt slightly prepared when the pandemic started. (laughs) You know, you and my in-laws would be having the best conversations about that. (laughs) Like my husband was, because I got, I got here like last December. Okay. And so, oh my gosh! Wait, two thousand nineteen December? Yeah. So you got there, and then like a couple months later, the world fell apart. Yeah, we got married, and like a week later, lockdown happened. Oh my god! How is your marriage? It's amazing. <laughs> That's because... awesome. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> because like we had so much time apart that we're really enjoying it. Like yeah. there's, there's times like, you know, I get snippy way more than he does because he's Sven is way, way better about, you know, not getting angry. Whereas I'm sometimes I can be a stereotypical Southern and I can just, you know, rah, and bite. Um, but he's, he's amazing about it. He handles it pretty well. I'm trying to get better about it, but yeah, i I got here in December. We got married in March, the first week of March. Oh my God. No, it wasn't even a week later. It was like less than that because I got married on a Saturday. There's only a couple of days a week or a couple of days a month that, that some of this stuff ha- can ha- was happening anyway. Mm-hmm. And so I happened to catch a, a date and they actually kept it. Ironically, I got married on my mother and my father's like anniversary and they were divorced. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, and then. Like, apparently it was, like, three or four other people's, and they were divorced as well. I'm like, well, that sucks for y'all, but I'm not gonna. No. You're gonna make uh, the date wonderful again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, because, like, we've we've been trying to be together for so long, and we've had such long conversations that I think a lot of couples don't necessarily have, because all we had was conversation. We only saw each other, like, twice before we got married. Oh, my gosh. My yeah. husband and I were long distance for four years, but we still saw each other because we both lived in the United States. So it was easier. But, like, for us, it's like it was like $800 a yeah. trip ticket for him to come see me. So, and that was a good deal. Um, but he came to see me. The first time we met, he came to see me when I graduated. Okay. Graduated college, and he he literally came to see me walk it was his first flight ever, and it was an international transatlantic flight. Oh, my God. Uh-huh. That's how you know you love somebody. My anxiety would have been crazy. <laughs> yeah. And, like, he had no idea what to expect, but he just, like, he soldiered on. It was like, okay, I was scared of this, but I need to go do it, so I did it. I've, I've got a really amazing husband, and sometimes I don't always remember how amazing he is because he's going to edit this and put it out. So, like... He isn't even here. He's sound asleep snoring in the other room, but he knows that, you know, when it comes to it, I need him to edit because I can't listen to myself speak. I get so bad about that. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I, I don't really I love can't. my voice, but I'm going to listen to this. <laughs> I get, I get very, um, I get very self-conscious about what I say and I don't want to do that when I'm doing these Yeah. because I want to be open and, and honest and who I am. And I don't want to feel like I need to change something if, it takes away the value of the podcast, no. so I can't edit. The first couple I did, and then I was like, I can't do this anymore, honey. He's like, okay, I'll do it. I was like, God bless. That's very nice of him. Yeah, because like he, like he was my guest for most of the time in the beginning of the podcast for that reason. Okay, yeah. And like I, I introduced him to a lot of, of stuff he didn't expect. And then um, in 2016, he came to see me. And the 2017... Because it always came at Christmas time. Mm-hmm. And then 2017 was our first Valentine's Day together. And then he had to go home like two days later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like he he and I have built a really strong relationship through that. So communication is not really a problem. Sometimes how we respond can be. But we were, we were prepared for the 
bogged down in that way. Yeah, definitely. Well, also, yeah. just after being long distance with my husband for a while, there is something so wonderful about, like, finally getting to be together. The touch, right? Like, you miss that so much. Like, it's like being able to sit say, next to each you. other and watch TV. Like, just like that, you know, yep. being in the same room. I used to fall asleep. When he would come to the States, I would fall asleep when we would watch anything because I felt so comfortable and so yeah. appreciative of him being there in that moment. So I get it. You just There's something about it that just makes it feel like every moment you have is magical. Did you apply to be on 90 Day Fiance the other way? No, I did not. Because probably I'm, smart. Like, I'm not having these people. I am not having these people ruin my relationship. I know, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, i have only... to wrap up talking because i can hear my kids all screaming downstairs yep. and i need to put them to bed so <laughs> is there a closing you want us to do <laughs> yes so right quick um tell people where you, they can find you and you know if there's anything else you want to talk about or any podcast that you want to talk about that we didn't talk about Ooh. okay well i i just have like one recommendation for the guests to give to whatever they listen to. Sounds good. You can find me at on Twitter at Lucy Hud H U D writes, and I'm most active on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at Lucy Hudson's Romance Corner. You can find all my books on Amazon, and some of my books on iBooks. <laughs> Not all of them. Some of my books on iBooks, and a podcast that I'll shout out. Does it have to be romance? Nope. I will shout out Stuff You Missed in History because that's my favorite non-romance podcast. And because we're all history nerds here, it's a very fun podcast that has quick episodes where you can pick if you go through their catalog and think to yourself, I want to learn something about Japanese history today. You can go to Japan, pick a historical episode that sounds good to you and learn just a snippet of history. And I really enjoy it. See, to me, that's cool because... I think every every person has an interest that makes sense to them, mm -hmm. and so I think having that that everyone has something um, that stands out, and I think that a history thing should always stand out because we're all romance readers. I know. So kind of have to deal with history every time we. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I also okay, forgot well. to say that I'm on Instagram, and I'm supposed to be pitching my Instagram right now. So on Instagram, <laughs> I'm Lucy Hudson Writer. Nice and easy. <laughs> Okay, one last thing. What's one book you would recommend? Oh my god, one? <laughs> what? No, like one book you've read like in the past like maybe month that you would recommend. Um, in the past month, I read a couple of duds before this one. Um, I'm trying to think <laughs> what I've read in the past month that I really liked. It could be a kid's book too. Oh my god, that's harder for me because I read hundreds of those a week. I'm also a children's <laughs> librarian, so I read a lot of kids' books. Okay, ones that you've actually actively read with your child. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so let's say, okay, <laughs> for an adult book that I recommend, we're going to go with, uh, mm, I want to say Brazen and the Beast, but I feel like everybody knows Brazen and the Beast, so I kind of want to mm -hmm. give a shout out to someone who doesn't get as much as Sarah McLean, so let me think for a second. Oh, oh, I know. Uh, which Witch is Witch. It's paranormal, but it's contemporary. It's by four authors, Kerrigan Byrne, Tiffany Helmer, uh, Cynthia Aubin, and Cindy Stark. And it's the beginning of a series. It's paranormal. It's super fun. It's very sexy. And if you like witches that really tow the good evil line, you'll like this book a lot. <laughs> See, that's awesome because I'd never heard of the book and I'm pretty sure a lot of my readers may not. So it kind of gives a little more shout out. Yes. And it was very fun. I have the second one on my Kindle, but haven't read it yet. And I can't wait to. It's a good, fun book to read, especially in during the spooky season. Exactly. I don't know if you've read it or not, but uh, the Vine Witch has a really great history. I have read the Vine Witch. Actually, I... Currently, the book that I, my paranormal series, the first one I'm currently querying, and The Vine Witch is one of my comps. 
Oh, cool. Because I love that. I've actually, I've got the Glamorous on my, on my I haven't read the Glamorous. Kindle, I just haven't read it. Yeah. I haven't read it yet either. It was on my Kindle to be reading. But I can't read, remember her I name can... now. But whoever's the heroine in the Glamorous, she was my favorite character in The Vine Witch. Yeah. She was the, um. She was like the, was kind the of like, yeah. yeah, like the circus performer, like kind of cabaret. Yeah. I liked her a lot. Yeah. I thought that might be appeal to your, uh. Yeah, history. I did like that book. <laughs> I did like that book a lot. History and Witches always good. That's so funny that you said that because the book that I pitched and that book, I just, I entered Pitch Wars uh, this week and those those were my two comps. (laughs) (laughs) So it makes sense. Cool. I love the Wine Witch. So yours should totally be picked up because the Wine Witch is amazing. Thank you. Hopefully there's some agents listening to this. (laughs) Hopefully so. If you are, let me know. (laughs) I will. (laughs) Yeah, but now go enjoy your kiddos. Enjoy the rest of your day. Go find some BLT. I will. <laughs> Cannot wait to put these kids to bed, eat my dinner, and watch some trashy TV with my husband. <laughs> you should. You should definitely watch Love After Lockup if you want. We, we will put it on the list because Love Island and Big Brother are almost over, so we're gonna have free time. <laughs> I mean, it makes Ninety Day Fiance seem sane. That sounds like our type of show. <laughs> so and again it's the same producer so you can know exactly what to expect perfect like wait wait until you meet Lacey and shane and john and she calls him john because she doesn't remember who she's dating at the time i love it already (laughs) (laughs) thank you so much for having me this was so much fun (laughs) thank you so much for coming i'll let you go now all right talk to you later (laughs) Bye. thanks guys i hope you enjoyed listening to the episode i want to thank lucy hudson for appearing on the podcast as the first author which is kind of cool i'm so glad she answered my shout out on twitter if you guys want to be on the podcast twitter seriously most easy way to get in touch with me because my phone is never far away and all it takes is a little beep 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 and I'm there. But Lucy was a great guest and I am so glad that we were finally able to do this because we've been talking on Twitter for a while and I appreciate the time and effort that she put into this in her very very chaotic life. Just like the rest of us. Because well life. I had a blast with Lucy I can't wait to discuss the next two books and enjoy Halloween month. It's kind of my husband's favorite month, so it became mine along the way. I have a few things that I'll probably have to do soon, like I mentioned in the beginning with the language stuff, but otherwise, I really can't wait to see what y'all think. If you guys want to leave a review and email me what you say at damselspodcast at gmail.com that would be great because sometimes I don't catch all the podcatchers because there's so many and I I want to know what you guys are are thinking and feeling and I want to know all those kind of thingies okay thingies you know because girl woman anyway uh, (laughs) you can also find me at Facebook which is probably not as active as it should be Patreon and Twitter and Instagram at damsels podcast Uh, Patreon is patreon.com slash damsels podcast to clarify as always like i say i try to make it as easy as i can for y'all i really really want you guys to enjoy the next month right because the world is on fire (laughs) i'm an american living overseas and i voted and i did the whole mail-in ballot thing trying to make it you know valid which is a whole thing and I get it, but I really, really hope my listeners go out and vote. Uh, Early vote, absentee vote, voting on the day. I want that because I want people to have a better world than what we've been given right now, right? The the world's kind of falling sideways, and if you're an American, that's really important because, unfortunately, for right or wrong, we kind of tend to push our presence to the rest of the world, and I want to make sure that what we're doing is okay. Thanks, guys. Enjoy. And maybe you'll find a little tidbit at the end of this episode. Right? You never know now. <laughs> See you. Mm-hmm.